HSBC, ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to Cambodia Global Dialogue of Southeast Asia TV. Uh, tonight, as you can see, I have a, a big panel, uh, and you wonder why, you know, three people. I said, well, because the subject is quite big, you know, it go all the way from the global uh, perspective down to a micro uh, level, you know, and I thought it'd be good to have a good perspective, and we will be talking about uh, renewable energy, and I have with me, you know, three uh, people who are, I would say, specialized in their own right, but I will not going to go further in that. I would prefer to let them speak for themselves. So I'm going to start with Nick. You know, uh, perhaps uh, you can say a bit about yourself, you know, and, and UNDP, of course. Oh, yeah, sure. Jim Rupsua. Uh My name is Nick Burris, and I'm country director here at uh, UNDP in Cambodia. Um, yeah, UNDP is involved in um, uh, many environmental, um, uh, many uh, uh, macroeconomic and other initiatives here in Cambodia and uh, our subject today, yes. um, solar energy. Uh, this is one that's uh, very close to our heart and one that we deal with in many of our offices around the world. Yes. Um, and, you know, Cambodia is no exception. Good. Well, uh, Dr. Bunlo. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tim Bunlo. I work as the Secretary General of the National Council for Sustainable Development. This is an interministerial uh, body responsible for uh, policy formulation uh, related to sustainable development, including right. renewable energy. Right. Back to you. Um, my name is Bridget McIntosh. I'm the director of Emerging Markets for Energy Lab. Uh, I have worked in uh, renewable energy for the last 20 years and our aim here in Cambodia in establishing Energy Lab is to facilitate uh, the clean energy market in Cambodia, but also to support the growth of entrepreneurs and startup companies to bring innovation and opportunities uh, for Cambodia in transforming and bringing investment in clean energy. All right, that's a lot mm -hmm. in uh, one sentence. Uh, no, I, I would say, you know, uh, we, we talk about uh, SDG, but much closer to home, you know, when we, we just came back from the ASEAN Summit in Singapore uh, and previous month, there's so many other international conference, uh, summit, but more than likely, the topic of climate change is there. More than likely, right? Of course, there are terrorism, there are, you know, uh, the, the Korean Peninsula, which is the talk of the day. But, you know, every time there is a topic on the effect of climate change. And I think, you know, uh, some uh, go further to say, okay, well, there are climate change issues, but what, what would be the, the solution, right? And of course, SDG is prominently there. You know, I think by now people uh, realize that, you know, we, we, we have to have this, uh, you know, Agenda 2030, you know, to tackle that and renewable energy is uh, a talk about that, right? And particularly, I'm, I'm about to go to, to Zurich for the A to prepare the Asia Europe Summit uh, in the next several months. And we'll talk about partnership. But again, partnership, again, how to tackle, how to have this partnership to tackle climate change. And in there is technology, renewable energy. But perhaps I'll start with you, Nick, uh, to, to set the stage a bit. How at the UN level, you know, SDG, you know, uh, you, you, uh, the, the UN is tackling this issue. And then later on, I will turn to Dr. Punlok to, uh, because uh, you, you are quite involved in the, uh, the Paris Accord. Yeah. Not the Paris Peace Accord, but the Paris Climate Change Accord. Right. Yeah. So Nick, well, I'll start with you. Uh, thanks, Sabana. I, I think there are two main agreements here which, which are relevant. Of course, the, the, the SDGs that um, uh, you, you mentioned uh, and the Paris Agreement. And I think that, you know, um, the central idea behind the SDGs is this concept of moving to sustainable development. It's moving away from um, a development model that got us very far, that did very well, but had a lot of costs, a lot of environmental costs. And it's looking at a cleaner, sharper, more efficient, more effective way of bringing that global prosperity to everybody. I mean, in the, you know, up to 2030, we could expect maybe another four, 4.5 billion middle-class consumers. Most of them, more than 60% of them, will be here in Asia. Yes. So, I mean, nothing could be more important to ASEAN and to, yes. the, to, you know, to this region. 
So you know, how do we affect that transition and make sure that transition, um, it works, it's effective, it's peaceful, yes. it's stable. Yes. And we you know we have to look at it from many different angles. And one of course is the energy angle. Mm. You know, how do we then build up a energy model um, within uh, individual countries, within the region globally, that enables that transition, that brings these uh, uh, millions of people up to a stable and prosperous middle-class existence, but without destroying the planet mm. that we live on. Yes, indeed. And that's really the, one of the central concepts in the SDGs, but also at the Paris Agreement, yes, yes. To, you know, to limit the greenhouse gas mm. emissions and to find this, uh, this way forward. Mm. Well, I, I'm I'm glad that you know uh, two years ago, uh, to be precise, right? The you know the Cambodia uh, delegation went to uh, New York. Uh, the, the Minister of uh, Environment went to sign, uh, and this is some proud moment that Cambodia is quite uh, you know active in the global scene nowadays, right? I mean, there's so many other things. We have the WTO. We have so many different uh, global, uh, like uh, for example, uh, the on the Apsara. Not many people know that. Uh, we are leading in terms of cultural uh, protection and preservation, right? But then here again, in this global uh, arena, in the area of environment, we are also taking a very proactive uh, you know, role in being a, one of the uh, signatory of the Paris Agreement. But what, what's your view on that? Well, uh, you know, uh, the government is very committed uh, to addressing uh, climate change. Uh, one of the reasons because uh, Cambodia is a very vulnerable country to the impact of climate change because uh, our economy still rely on agriculture, uh, the, the risk of uh, being uh, you know, inundated in the coastal area by uh, uh, sea level rise and, and so on. Uh, so we are uh, among the first country who signed the Paris Agreement and uh, Parliament ratified in uh, uh, late 2016, mm -hmm. but again, Cambodia is a still least developed country. Yes. We uh, participate in a global effort to address climate change on a voluntary basis and provided the uh, international community, especially industrialized country, uh, give support to us. You know, finance, technology, mm -hmm. know-how. Mm -hmm. uh, we it's not just about uh, to adapt to climate change, also to mitigate uh, yes. greenhouse gases. Yes. It is one of the reasons uh, why we also focus on uh, renewable energy, yes. especially uh, solar, hydro, uh, to a lesser extent uh, wind, mm. uh, because of the technical potential. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, no, again, from a developing country perspective, it's not just about cutting emission. Mm. It's not just about reducing uh, carbon uh, uh, dioxide emission. Uh, this technology, solar especially, you know, uh, it provides very clean energy. Mm. Mm. You know, uh, there's no uh, also pollutant associated. You know, yes. uh, uh, sulfur or, or, or the air pollutant. Technology doesn't emit pollutant. Yes, it uh, modern technologies. It uh, provide jobs, mm. uh, uh, investment as well. If we talk about mm. manufacturing, you know, to reduce the cost. Uh, and it become more competitive. Mm. You know, mm. when they uh, invented the technology in the early uh, forty, the cost I think it was uh, about three hundred US dollar per uh, watt mm. capacity. Yes. Now I know it's dropped to zero point three. Now it's going down further. In in how many years was that? There? How many de how uh, many decades? Uh, 50, 60 wow, years. Wow, that's not bad. <coughs> yes. Exponential. Exponential. Yes. yes. So it, technology itself become very competitive. Yes. So it's it's provide mm. a, a multiple benefits yes. to the country. You know, economy, environment, social, yes. job, everything. Yeah. Uh, uh, look, I uh, I think you mentioned something very important for Cambodia because we have quite a young uh, population. I call the more the the uh, the reverse uh, pyramid, right? Where we have more younger people. You know, very hungry for knowledge, very, very adaptable to technology. Everybody have play PS4 game. So I tell my son, don't worry, just enjoy the game because it increase your mobility, your understanding. And you know what he say? He say, Dad, I'm not playing game. This is a strategy session here. You know, we're four people in different part of the world. You know, we're helping each other how to tackle the bad guy, whatever. 
Uh, but basically what it is, is technology, right? So here I'm, I'm turn to you, Bridget, that, you know, you, uh, your organization is working with young, uh, uh, young people. They can be entrepreneur, they can be young uh, software developer, whatever, right? Uh, it's about employment. It's about potential to unleash this, this energy, this mm -hmm. use, this, uh, you know. What, mm -hmm. what, uh, tell me a bit about what your view on that. Well, following on from what Wanlock was saying, that the cost of solar has dropped so significantly. When I moved to Cambodia in 2003, the cost of solar was $10 a watt, mm. and now it's less than, uh, it's around 30 cents a watt. Uh, well, significantly less than a dollar or what. Mm. Uh, so with the rapidly declining costs of solar, it brings a massive investment opportunity. So in China last year, mm. $87 billion was invested in solar just in one year. Mm. And half of all the world's solar mm. was built in China last mm. year. Uh, that is also being played out in Thailand and Vietnam. Yes. And you have countries like uh, California, where 10% of their electricity mm. over a year is supplied mm. from solar power. Mm. And in fact, on the 5th of March this year, 50% of California's electricity was supplied by solar on one day. Wow. So over, an, over a year, it's 10%. Mm. Yes. So there is a significant opportunity. The cost of solar is now competitive mm. in many countries with building new coal yes. or uh, building new fossil fuel technologies. Mm. Mm. So with that opportunity mm. comes the need for managing mm. how you deal with variable renewable yes. supply. Yeah. Because we know that the sun doesn't always shine, but we also know that you don't get power at night time. Ah, okay. So with the rapidly declining costs yes. of storage technology, yeah. <clears throat> we have an opportunity to manage distributed energy resources mm. across the grid. Mm. And that's when you get the opportunity of combining technology, mm. uh, like ICT technology, with the renewable energy, mm. solar technology. Yeah. Uh, Bridget, I'm gonna, I'm mm. gonna cut you uh, short because we have to take a short break, but I'll give you back the floor when we're back. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, so have you water a bit? <laughs> so far, so good. See, one third is done already. I appreciate it. Uh, go on. Uh, so <clears throat> with the rapidly declining costs of solar and information technologies, we have new innovative business models. Mm. So pay-as-you-go solar is one of those innovative business okay. models that allows customers to pay off their solar system mm. uh, and in, uh, allows investor certainty. So the investor can pay for the system and then the mm. customer can pay it off as they go using mobile technology. Yes. There's also what's called virtual power plants where you can make say 1,000 or 10,000 solar home systems mm. act in concert together to act as big as a medium-sized power station. So if you have an event where it's looking like we're short on power, you can mm. combine those together mm. to provide power mm. into the grid and provide some of that stability. There are a lot of innovations that are yeah. happening yeah. around electricity as we're seeing it shift from a centralized hmm. model into yes. a decentralized yes. model across the energy system. Yeah. Well, Bridget, I, 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 that's good. There's a lot of business model, but, but to me, I'm, I'm, I'm back to uh, Punlok that uh, from the policy perspective, of course, uh, the government is keen for that. But, you, you know, when we talk about industry, industry requires quality you know, energy. Uh, by that, I mean to power the big uh, machine, the big plant, right? So the, how, how is the interlinkage with the regular grid? You know, uh, my understanding is that, you know, we, uh, when you have uh, renewable energy produced, you have to feed back to the grid. But do we have a clear policy as, as to how this will work, for example? Uh, at this stage, I think it's... Uh uh, short regulation issued yeah. by uh, Electricity Authority of Cambodia, which required a potential uh, user who wants to install a solar system uh, to, you know, to re request uh, for a kind of permission from them. Okay. So there's no uh, comprehensive uh, yes. regulation. We don't have feed-in tariff or net metering in place yet. Not yet. Not but yet. Uh, 
Yes. You expect it will it will be coming? Uh, it will come one day. You oh, know, I, I think a, a proper assessment need to be done. Yes, we need to understand better better the technical potential of yes. uh, our resources, yes. the solar especially, and also the the economy of uh, of uh, solar technology in Cambodia as well. You know, mm. say comparing with the uh, you know if we d decide to use the land for installation of solar, yes. what what about other opportunity costs? Mm. No? Yes, so this have to be, to be taken into account. Mm. The existing key player, like uh, existing power purchase agreement yes. uh, with the thermal power plants, yes. need to be taken into mm. account. Yes. So it's uh, it's not straightforward. It's mm. not just about technology. It's, yes. it's, it's, it's politics here. Mm. It's economy. Mm. It's environment. It's uh, social. So in brief, I think it's important to have very comprehensive mm. assessment. Yes. And then of course, you know, look how how, how best can we improve the yes. in our environment. You know? Yes. Uh, mm. You know, uh, uh, at the standard yes. legislation, yeah. uh, policy, of course, uh, maybe economic tools, yes, yes. you know, uh, uh, tax uh, yes. policy, mm. uh, uh, funds, uh, support, yeah. and so on. Yeah, so so I think below, I, I'll get back to you on, on this later, but I, I want to go back to Nick because, Nick, I mean, UNEP, uh, what we talk, it's a lot to do with the economy of scale, large. Uh, production, the sort of thing, but, you know, not every Cambodian live in this big city. Not everybody has access to the grid. UNEP, you, you work quite a bit with rural electrification. Uh, many people in remote areas would never have a transmission line to get there. You know, they use a battery to... Uh, but it's interesting, nowadays, you, you go to countryside, Monokuri, Ratnakuri, you see TV and antenna, or something like this. So something is happening at the rural level. Uh, what what is UNDP uh, work on that? You know, in terms of rural electrification, with no access to grid. Well, I mean, like <coughs> like the, uh, the the government itself, you know, UN UNDP, we're all committed to this idea of no one left behind. Mm -hmm. You know, that everybody gets to benefit yes. from the power and the prosperity. You know, so that's our kind of starting point, if you like. We know, practically speaking, that because of you know the topography, the geography, there mm -hmm. may be certain communities. Who may never get onto the grid, or be very late. Even by 2030, we might estimate 20% mm. of users might be off mm. grid. I mean, for instance, on the islands and so on. Yeah. So we have to find solutions for them. You know, the good news is, I think, you know, as Bridget and Dr. Ponlock were saying, you know, we're seeing this wave of new technology coming through. You know, yes. so we can ride this wave. Mm. You know, we can anticipate there's going to be continuing benefits, more uh, innovative models, more decentralized models, and so on. And this provides good solutions, I think, for for uh, for those communities. Mm, mm. And then we can see much less of an us and them, much yes, more yes. of a holistic approach yes, yes. to power yes. and to energy that involves grid, mm. that involves off-grid, mm. but has good coordination. Yes. I think Dr. Punlock's absolutely right. At the heart of it, the most important thing is good policy, mm. government-owned policy, and also policy that looks holistically. Mm. It considers the social, it considers the economic, it considers uh, you know the, the effects on private business yeah. and so on and so forth, and then comes up with sensible um, regulations that are suitable to the context here in Cambodia. Yes. But my point is, I think there's a lot of opportunity for, for the, for the off-grid. Yes. We're already seeing a lot of success, so mm. we already have a lot of experience. <clears throat> we have some great startups here. We have some, uh, you know, uh, some really interesting players mm. in the private sector already mm. working there. So I think if we look at that dynamic private sector that we've got, mm. we've got this young, yes. prosperous economy, and uh, we've got a government committed mm. to looking at the best solutions in terms of energy and uh, addressing climate change. Mm. You know, there's a great, there's a great policy opportunity yeah, yeah. there. I, 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 I see. For me, having sort of monitored the last uh, twenty some year of Cambodia. Development, right? we we see a lot of uh, opportunity for catching up in many areas. Like uh, now, you're talking about fintech, right? You have uh, a lot of these young Cambodians who are really embracing that uh, the fourth industrial revolution. Now the idea start at the big level, but you see a lot of the young Cambodia embracing. Uh, and in the renewable energy, I see that is the next uh, the next area that it will be uh, quick take off. Like you say, if the, the cost of, of technology is down, the spirit of entrepreneurship is there. Uh, but Log, you probably can agree with me that we have many young Cambodians who have studied abroad, are coming back now, 
our university, ITC, for example, uh, the Jerome Institute, uh, they are producing a lot of young, good uh, technicians. I think the element uh, for a, a, a growth is there because the, uh, the way I see, right, if you have electricity in a home in Mundogiri, right, the kids can read at night. Mm -hmm. You know, they can charge a, a, a smartphone. And with a smartphone, uh, they could have access to internet, to knowledge. It, it's amazing the, the, the impact of energy. You know? mm. what, what, what do you think of that, Bridget? Oh, I agree, absolutely. And uh, there are new technologies and new business models coming. So, for example, there's a startup here in Cambodia called Okra Solar, and they provide a, a, a control box that allows homes that have solar home systems with a home that doesn't have a solar home system to share the power yeah. and so on and so forth. Wow. So it's smart management hmm. of electri electricity sharing from hmm. solar. So what that allows them to do, customers to do, is use more power than what's uh, limited within their battery. Mm. Uh, you also uh, have, say, a distributor up in Kompong Chenang mm. that is running a diesel genset to supply power to that uh, electricity grid. Uh, uh, there is a chance now to add, say, 200 kilowatts of solar onto that to lower the cost mm -hmm. of uh, electricity to customers. Yeah. Because ultimately in Cambodia, this is where we need to go, is reducing the cost mm. of electricity, mm. and solar allows that. Mm. There's also a distribution network in Kompong Cham that's mm. added a megawatt of solar, and they're buying the solar cheaper than uh, they're currently getting it, so that they can provide power mm. to their mm. customers mm. for cheaper. Oh. And it, it's, it's investment, it's all private investment. Mm. You've got Coca-Cola that's installed yes. 2.3 megawatts on ISPP their ISPP also. ISPP, Shaco, yes. Anchor Dairy, ISI Steel. There are a lot of private investment that's not related to any um, subsidies. Mm. Uh, it's all private investment. And as Dr. Pollock mentioned, it's around the regulatory uncertainty mm. certainty that will allow investors to mm. come. Mm. So the prakas that EAC introduced in January yes. and then the pricing disclosure that they released last week really helps oh, so that investors know mm. where they stand. Mm. Mm. So that's for medium voltage and mm. high voltage. Now what would be great is if we could get the same in place for low voltage, low voltage. so that we can work out, for example, for households mm. whether uh, a house wants to install mm. a solar home yes. system. Yes. And then, you know, we can work towards uh, policies around feed-in tariffs. Mm. At the moment, mm. we're not there yet. Yes. And Thailand did the same thing. Mm. Thailand started by saying, okay, we'll have a target of 100 megawatts of self-consumption, mm. which means that you can put solar on a roof and you can use it, mm. uh, but you can't export mm. it to the grid. And now Thailand's just changing that policy to allow for a feed-in mm. tariff mm. or a net metering arrangement. Mm. Vietnam also has a net metering arrangement, mm. but these are new. Mm. And as Dr. Ponlot said, it's important to go step by step yes. and test a small amount yes. so that everyone, EDC, EAC, customers, can be certain about where things well, will go. Well, I mean, it, this is where I see public and private partnership, right? And uh, Ponlot uh, uh, would agree with me that uh, this government is very open in terms of uh, reaching out uh, to new ideas, uh, working with the private sector, we, we, we have a very dynamic exchange with the development partner. I mean, uh, this is something that I'm quite, I would say, a bit about uh, this openness, mm -hmm. right? And that's probably uh, that very spirit openness that enables Cambodia to, to grow so fast, you know? Many times I, I have uh, overseas people that come and ask about a very complex uh, issue, you know, uh, very technical, I say, look, we're not in London, we're not in, uh, you know, I would say, Sydney or Paris, right? A lot of things that uh, you all take for granted, we're still experimenting. It's still very novel to us, but we're willing to listen. You know, what can we learn mm -hmm. from your mm -hmm. particular experience? Mm -hmm. And that's probably uh, why Cambodia is, is, is very good at uh, emulating, right? And sometimes a bit too much, you know, we, we copy each other too much. But uh, what, what do you think of this public-private sector partnership? Well, uh, I think this is a key factor to uh, promote uh, technology, to promote uh, new in investment. Uh, the government, of course, uh, provide all the policy, the assessment, but it's, it's the, the private sector who, who is the key driver 
or the, who invest because well, but we need to provide evidence, yes, you know, yes. that they will make money. Yes. You know, this is important for them. Yes. So the uh, proper assessment that produce, you know, very solid evidence, you know, economic, environment, social, climate, and so on, is important for mm. engaging the, the private sector. Yes. They would not raise, you know, uh, if they they see that uh, they don't uh, get more from mm. the business as usual scenario. Yes. And we have learned that lesson uh, yes. from the you know, previous round of implementation of the, the so-called Kyoto Protocol. Yes. Yes. You know, when a um, uh, uh, developing country can can implement uh, gre greenhouse mitigation projects mm. Mm. Uh, and also sell the carbon uh, credit mm -hmm. generated from the project to mm. the international market. So we lobbied the private sector uh, to implement. They mm. uh, uh, quite a number of them uh, mm. started the project, but then uh, the carbon price collapsed. Mm. So uh, they're in trouble. So this is very bad lesson for them. Yes, Otherwise, yes. I think uh, proper assessment, very vigorous, very uh, yes. reliable assessment is important for them. Mm. If they are about to fail, they need to file uh, very safe. Yes. You know? <laughs> it cannot be worse than business as usual. Yeah. Yes, yes. And, and this also refer to international uh, community commitment, especially yes. commitment from uh, industrialized countries, you yes. know, uh, either uh, funding, hmm. technology transfer, uh, proper pricing of uh, carbon and so on, all these uh, external hmm. factors hmm. so can help, uh, you know, uh, uh, promote investment in this clean technology Good. in Cambodia. Mm -hmm. Good. We're going to take a short break final break. We'll come back Nick, I will want you to maybe uh, tackle a bit where are we now on the SDG and then I'll turn to uh, Dr. Punlo for where are we now on the implementation of the Paris Agreement. All right, we'll take another break. Well Nick, you know we have a new uh, uh, UN Secretary General. Uh, I was at the Boa Forum uh, a couple of weeks ago, he made a very good speech, you know, linking to the Bell and Road and everything, you know, the current, uh, uh, sort of like the concern of a potential U.S.-China trade war, the, you know, uh, the, the larger uh, uh, issue, which have a direct impact on, you know, the implementation of the SDG, right? One hope it will not get that far. Uh, President Trump have sent his emissary already to China to negotiate, you know. So, you know, when we use the word negotiate, you know, it's, it's a good sign that, you know, people are, you know, trading horses. But uh, from, from, from our uh, UN SDG perspective, the, uh, you know, 2030 development agenda, uh, it's still, still new, but uh, are we on track? A any challenge that you can share with us? Oh. Well, we've certainly had a good history because yes. of the Millennium Development Goals. Yes. You know, uh, Cambodia was a superstar. Yes. I mean, it achieved number one, you know, the uh, halving of poverty years mm. ahead of the target. Yes. You know, it's had tremendous economic growth driven by this dynamic private sector. You know, the government ha has very successfully um, uh, helped bring that about. But it's also been very inclusive. Mm. So it's not just um, a, a, a large amount of economic growth. It's also many people coming out of poverty. You know, mm. poverty mo you know, more than halved in, mm. in, in the past 10, 15 years, as well as the economy tripling in size. Mm. So I think taking that successful model forward into the SDGs, you know, we're, we're very well placed. Mm. You know, um, the Cambodian Sustainable Development Goals are just being written right now in conjunction with the rectangular strategy. Yes. Um, the government's added an 18th sustainable goal on uh, demining. Yes, yes. Um, so I think there's, you know, there's real commitment there. There's a history of success. So I think that we have good grounds to be uh, optimistic going yes. forward. Mm. That's very good. Uh, speaking of demining, uh, you know, we 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 become uh, Cambodia become a a sort of a regional uh, player now. We have this ASEAN Regional Mine uh, yeah. uh, Center Action Center. That's where, you know, in, in ASEAN, people come to learn uh, uh, from, from us, you know. So it's quite interesting that, you know, uh, we flip a crisis, a country that has so many unexploded mines, you know, now we become the expert in the mining, you know. We, I think we have uh, more than 
few thousand, uh, I, I forgot the number, a few thousand of our you know, Cambodian uh, UN peacekeeper. Nearly 5,000. Nearly 5,000 Between 2006 mm. and now, I think yes. it's more, nearly 5,000 5, Cambodian yes. from, the, from the Royal are Army serving, served in the... Are uh, serving the blue, uh, you know, uh, the blue helmet or the blue uh, beret, right? It, it, it's quite uh, something to be proud of that we are now uh, a contributor to the world in terms of uh, peacekeeping, uh, that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite uh, happy, you know, uh, we, we've been able to receive, but now we're in a position to give. Uh, look, on the climate change, you know, I, I, I read, uh, I do follow uh, regularly, you know, the discussion, you know, on the climate change. Uh, so where are we now? Well, as you know, we uh, uh, signed the Paris Agreement a couple yes. of years ago, and then uh, the Parliament uh, ratified uh, our permanent representative uh, deposited uh, the instrument of accession okay. uh, in early 2017. So yes. the Paris Agreement is uh, in, in force for yes. Cambodia. So we implement this uh, uh, agreement through a document called it. Um, nationally determined contributions. You know? Yes. It is a document that summarizes government plan policies related to climate change and it covers both mitigation and adaptation. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, at the national level we have a Cambodia uh, uh, strategic development plan yes. uh, which also uh, cover include the uh, climate change extensively for all sectors. Okay. And then the climate change strategy action plans uh, for the next uh, 10 years up to 2023. Yes. Uh, based on that, line ministry, uh, 14 line ministry have uh, developed the uh, climate change action plan, okay. which is uh, an actual activity mm. related to climate change, both mitigation and adaptation. So we are on good track. We are developing a monitoring and evaluation framework uh, yes. to to check the, the progress or, or issues mm -hmm. or challenges that are related to implementation of our commitment. But I, I want to highlight here, you know, Cambodia is a developing country yes. and implementation of uh, mitigation activities mm -hmm. is on a voluntary basis. Yes, yes. And provided that uh, we receive uh, support also uh, from uh, international community, mm -hmm. either finance or technology. Yeah. You know. And we have done a, a, a rough estimation that, mm. you know, uh, how much we need. Yes, wow. So by 2020s, we need uh, around 1.8 billion US dollars. You mean in, in two years' time? Yes, uh, yeah. to implement all the plans. Wow. Yes, so it's important. But uh, also I want to highlight that the government also uh, increased the, the climate finance as well. It, uh, if you look at the statistics from the Ministry of Economy, yes, and the finance, budget, budget, the budget, yes, I yes. think the uh, budget for climate relevant project mm. has also increased. Mm. So this also indicate that we are not just waiting for funding yes. from yes. You know, uh, international community. We use our domestic funding yes. as well to implement those actions. Yes, mm. well, that that's good. I mean, and and I I would say it's it's not going to be tomorrow that we'll solve this uh, uh, world problem. But the main thing is that we're on track. You know, and then uh, it's sort of like a rolling plan, you know. You know, by 2020, we will have, uh, you know, some other activity. And, you know, uh, uh, Bridget, you know, you mentioned that the, the pace of technological advancement is so fast that uh, what you plan for a few years from now may become obsolete. Then there'll be other things that, that will change uh, the course of uh, this implementation aspect of it. But on the private sector, on the civil society side, uh, uh, what, what, what do you foresee the next several years uh, taking into account this dynamic uh, you know, evolution of technology, the dramatic uh, reduction of costs? Mm. You know, how do you see, we, as, uh, as Panlok said, uh, we, we are still a developing country, um, you know, as we move up the ladder of uh, from a lower middle income country to a lower, no, eventually will be a, a middle income country, but we are now still at the lower middle income country. Mm. But the effect of aid, of development aid, will be diminished as we economically grow, right? So I see, you know, some moving out, but some moving in. in uh, donor may be moving out to other areas, mm. but the role of uh, entrepreneurship, the role of private sector, the role of uh, you know, civil society are taking a larger space. Mm. 
I agree, absolutely. And what we see is that the ultimate objective is to reduce the cost of power so that Cambodia's economy can grow. Power is still quite expensive, mm. and for industry that makes it difficult. Uh, and EDC and the government of Cambodia are working very hard to reduce the tariffs. Uh, and what we need to make sure is that EDC and the government makes a return on investment of the incredible transmission and distribution network that they yes. have set up in Cambodia, yes. where now 80% of villages across Cambodia has access to electricity. Mm. That is amazing. We also need to make sure that the energy generators and the agreements that have been signed have, mm. can be honoured. But with the rapid growth of electricity demand, mm. we can see renewable energy and clean energy supply mm. a lot of that power. Mm. And the benefit of particularly solar power is that it can be done incrementally, yes. so small amounts, so you mm. can add, say, 20, 50, 100, 200 mm. megawatts quite slow, uh, quite quickly mm. to build it. it. It can actually take sort of three months to build. Yes, yes. And then as demand grows, you can supply that power. Mm. But it's not just about supply. It's also about managing resources across the system. Mm. Energy efficiency is actually the cheapest way to reduce energy costs. Mm. And you have uh, innovative business models like Green Yellow here yes. in Cambodia, which will invest in energy efficiency uh, equipment for a company, mm. say mm. a garment factory, and that company will own the energy efficiency equipment and then sell uh, mm. and then share the savings yeah. over, say, eight years mm. with, mm. say, that garment factory. Mm. And what that does is allow investment to reduce mm. energy consumption, save money yes. for both the garment factories but also for uh, the financial investment mm. that they make. So risk can be the most expensive part about mm. financing. So having some of the great policies that the government are putting out mm. means that that risk can be managed and then investment can flow. And then we will get more and more innovations. Mm. All right, that sounds promising. Uh, we're running out of time now. Uh, and I'm going to ask Nick uh, and all of you to share maybe your last thought. What do what, what you think? What's the takeaway uh, from the audience, particularly the, the younger generation who are following our, our program? What, what, what's your takeaway from that, Nick? I see this great policy opportunity. So I see this dynamism, this innovation, but I also see a government very focused on a clear development path. And then I think we put that together. You know, NCSD is very well placed. Mm. In fact, it was created to, to a liaise be between governments to, to look at sustainable development. You know, this is a great policy opportunity and now uh, we, uh, we should seize it. It's got all sorts of benefits for us. It crowds in private investment, it boosts growth, it brings in new technology. And it also, when we think about Cambodia becoming an upper middle income country, becoming even a high income country, it also puts us on a sustainable path where emissions are low and that's environmental benefits for everybody. Hello? Oh, I fully agree that it's important, you know, policy, but uh, again, you know, uh, in addition to that technology, I think it is an opportunity for Cambodia to leapfrog this traditional, very carbon intensive, you know, fossil fuel based technology as well. Well, we, we like to compare it with smartphone, you know, mm. when we uh, skip all, almost completely this, uh, you know, ugly boots, phone boots, uh, you know, that dotted uh, in uh, most developed countries. Uh, because once we put it here, it's become, a, how do you call it, a strength? Stranded asset. Asset, you know, yeah. for the next 30 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. And then we really were lost opportunity. So, uh, this, this, you know, it's a kind of opportunity to leapfrog mm -hmm. this uh, quite polluting technology and embrace technology that is very clean, uh, provides, you know, multiple benefit for the society. Mm -hmm. Bridget? What we find here in Cambodia is an incredible ability from the younger generation to uh, innovate around technology. And when you combine that innovation around technology with clean energy, you can have incredible results. So that company I was talking to you about, that startup here in Cambodia, they're already looking to export their technology to Indonesia and Africa is a massive market wow. for them. So the innovations around bringing technology and solar together allow 
Cambodia to really work out how you integrate centralised systems that we have in place, fossil fuel plants. We have amazing hydro resources and hydro you can manage. So variability in say solar can be managed by hydro. And so we can innovate around tariffs and we can also innovate around business models and we can also innovate around new technologies. And electric vehicles is just another step in the direction of managing a system across transport, across wow. industry, across consumers. Well, Bridget, Malog, uh, Nick, uh, thank you so much for, for coming and share this very exciting uh, uh, field, which I think will be a, a, a major, you know, uh, I, wouldn't, I don't want to use the word revolution, but a major boost into uh, Cambodia economic uh, uh, development and uh, put Cambodia on the map again. You know, hopefully, we'll, uh, like you say, we will skip the learning curve, we will catch up with the neighbor. And I, I want to close by saying one thing that I was uh, recently attending the ASEAN Summit in Singapore and uh, this year Cambodia chaired the AIA Task Force, the Initiative for ASEAN Integration. And it's interesting that in the report, we see that the goal of the initiative is to help the, the, the reduce the development divide between the advanced ASEAN and the newcomer, right? The gap is closing very fast. So, with the renewable energy being on the as another component of this uh, uh, catching up, I, I hope that uh, uh, Cambodia and other you know country, particularly the CLMV, could uh, catch up uh, with neighbor and and make ASEAN as a whole you know a, a strong community, a resilient community. And Bridget, you keep saying about innovation because uh, Singapore team this year is all about smart city innovation. So. Bridget, thank you so much. Hello, it's a pleasure to see you. Thank you. Nick, as always, thank you. Well, I'm not going to bother summarizing. There's so much that we, we have discussed. I just hope that you, you learn something about it and you start putting your mind to it. And for those uh, who are in business, the entrepreneur, embrace that, you know. And for government official, of course, we hope that uh, you will help uh, Punlok uh, develop a good policy, you know. And Nick, of course, you got to mobilize the development partner to help uh, Cambodia achieve uh, this, uh, this potential. So on that note, uh, good night and I'll see you next week.